So hi everyone, this is an LTSI interview with uh, Professor Mohammad Rela. Uh, as you know, we do this section called Up Close and Personal, where we try to interview um, personalities and experts in the field of liver transplant, so that we get to know them both professionally and personally. I think uh, Mohammad Rela, everybody knows his uh, work, but we want to know more about him as a person and what made him be here. So first of all, on behalf of uh, LTSI, I would like to congratulate you to, on becoming the LTS president. Uh, it's a great honor not only for you but for all the fraternity in India uh, since you are representing all of us. So what does this mean to you and you know, the fact that you are representing Indian uh, front, front team? Thank you. Thank you Murugan for coming for this interview. Um, ILTS president, uh, I mean I've been um, part of ILTS for many years and um, um, and have been um, a counsellor for the last uh, four or five years and um, I think it was just a progression actually within it. Um, but one needs to think about the leadership in order to really achieve it. Um, I personally think, see, I was in the UK for 25 years and I feel that um, I progressed quite a lot after coming to India. Um, and me becoming an ILTS president was, is, I believe, is also for the work that I do and what I represent. I think um, India is becoming very important in the field of liver transplantation, particularly in the field of living donor liver transplantation. Um, and uh, me being selected is very much as an Indian uh, and to represent India in the international scene. So it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling and I hope um, I can do some work to, to improve um, liver transplantation around the world. So I just want to take you back to your childhood. Uh, we come from a similar area. My ancestors came from yeah. South India called Maila to the right. And you were just chatting earlier and you said you were born there. I was so born I about there. six miles away from, six kilometers away from where your area is. Right. You're, you're from the town. I There are many small villages around Maila to the right and um, ours is um, one of the villages um, near Mailaradurai. I was I was born there in a small village, um, and I did my early schooling there um, up to um, third, fourth standard. Um, in fact, in a garment school, just like all the other children. There was only one school in the village, village, and I studied in the village school. Uh, and my father thought that um, I sh we should be as a as a family educated. He worked in Singapore. Uh, so he moved us all to Chennai. The plan was for my mother also to move to Chennai. He worked in um, uh, Singapore. And, um, and first he put us in the hostel in Kalakshetra. So, uh, so he put us in the children's hostel in Kalakshetra. And uh, there was a Montessori school attached to the Kalakshetra. So I studied there first. And then Basin Theosophical High School later. So you think the schooling that you had is a little different from what we did as kids around the same time because we all went to convents and yeah, it's yeah. a structured learning but also it means rote learning and the entire emphasis on marks and what you produce but I understand your uh, the school you went to was a little different uh, yeah it, it was different um, I mean Kalakshetra is uh, more focused on really uh, music and dance and not just the schooling um, and we didn't have uh, exams um, until the fifth standard, so you automatically were passed. Uh, yeah, it, was still a Montessori. it was yeah, it was a Montessori school, and it was a Tamil medium school. It's only after the sixth standard that I went into okay. English medium. And um, the Western Theosophical High School was in Adiyar, which was um, very much associated with both the Theosophical Society as well as Kalakshetra. Both of them were associated with that school. So from arts and dance, what made you become a doctor? I think I wanted to become a doctor um, a very young age. I still remember, I think um, boys always wanted to become pilots those days. I don't know if this changed. I think now they want to become engineers. Okay. Um, in, the, in my class once, I think maybe sixth standard or something, the teachers were trying to find out um, um, what uh, each student wanted to become and uh, they said how many of you wanted to become a doctor I, th I remember even at that time I put up my hand and said I wanted to become a doctor and to my surprise no one in that class around me actually wanted to become a doctor I was really embarrassed 
really i thought maybe this is not a good profession you want actually become a doctor no a no from that class nobody no. else other than um, yes, other than me okay. um you have good the memories of your surgical training here your ms yeah i i i think in the in the school i did well at school actually i, I was um, i was i had the highest mark in sslc exam um and i got into stanley um pretty immediately after finishing school um i think stanley was good um the the college days were good good friends and um um i don't know i i was quite on the top at school but i think i dropped down when i was in college um maybe the college students wouldn't have seen me as uh, one of the top students but i feel that i was always always good maybe didn't um, show it that much when i was um, in college and i finished my mbbs there um and then was my struggle um i didn't get an ms seat for 2 years um at that time there were no uh, entrance examination everything was based on uh really interviews and it was very political it, okay. it depended on who you knew um for two years i didn't get into ms so i i stayed in the um, um same unit um the surgical unit where i uh, was doing um um uh, the surgical unit where i did uh, my undergraduate days um and there used to be something called um senior house surgency yeah. you know yeah. unpaid um and i did that for 2 years okay. um and then they introduced the entrance exam for the first time i think in 19 um uh 85 uh, 82 i finished the mbbs and 1985 and i took the entrance exam and got one of the highest marks there i think i got the highest mark in that entrance exam uh, so i stayed in the same unit chandra as as a as a ms post graduate but this two years really affected me a lot okay. i felt very insecure and uh, really didn't feel good about myself okay. then i decided uh, then maybe i blame myself first and then i blame the system and i d- i decided that i will go abroad and okay. um, e and um, this decision was made um, uh, before i got my ms okay. and then when the entrance exam came i got ms but i didn't change my mind I decided I I wanted to go in fact I I just about completed MS and um while doing MS itself I I went to the UK did my PLAB exam and did my part one FRCS exam came back um those days if you do the senior house surgency um for one year you get one year exemption in MS in fact I I only did 2 years for my MS um and then even before the results came out I was back in the UK Yeah. So you did your further training in the UK and yes. that shaped a lot of what you are today. So maybe can tell us <laughs> Yeah, again it's a, it's probably been a struggle all around anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um I went to so the I UK around the same time maybe a little later than you. Yeah, probably. You are much younger than me I think. Few years. Yeah, I I went there because I I felt there was no opportunity in India, but I thought I'll get my fellowship and then come back here after 4 5 years. But um in fact every year was a struggle really for the first 4 to 5 years and um um I wanted to be a urologist. Um I went and did um the first 2 years was sent uh, spent as a, a senior level SHO. They used to have the senior SHO post really. where you were third on call and then i became a registrar in general surgery and then i did urology first in that registrar job uh, which i liked but uh, i did not get um, really teaching hospital posts in order to train as a urologist i mean they classified people into um, what they call career registrar and overseas registrar so i was always an overseas registrar um and i didn't get a good urology post at all i mean i again i was frustrated about that and then i moved down for the next job to kent um did vascular so i did quite a bit of urology quite a bit of vascular and and a lot of general surgery so in that middle grade registrar level i worked for almost 5 years and then liver also i did 2 years in middle grade registrar level so almost 7 years in a middle grade registrar level and then 
people started asking me, what are you doing here? When are you going to go back to India? And it was all about um, really extending your visa every time you get a job and you get the fear whether you're going to get an extension of visa. And, uh, and then finally, um, somebody said, you might want to do liver uh, because they used to do annual, that's right. They used to do annual registrar interviews. And, the, and the, those interviews happened in the teaching hospital and there were many district general hospitals attached to the teaching hospital. So I went to King's because King's was our local teaching hospital. And one of the senior lecturers who interviewed me said, what are you doing here? You've been here for six years and uh, not getting anywhere and uh, either you go back on or do something. And he said, in liver there are many overseas people and um, there's a surgeon called KC Tan uh, there are no um, local posts, there are no teaching posts in that or registrar training posts there. Um, so most of the people who are working there are overseas. So I went and met Casey Tan and uh, he said, okay. And um, in fact, he had two people in mind. Uh, when a job came, um, he said he gave me the job because he couldn't get the other guy. <laughs> anyway. Fate has given us an excellent answer. <laughs> yeah, so I, I went into King's, but again, King's was tough. King's, that was the only job where I felt uh, really um, humiliated and inferior okay. for the first few months. Okay. And then Nigel Heaton became a colleague and things changed and, um, and we worked together as partners. I mean, I was in King's for 25 years. Um, and I got appointed very quickly. I, was, I did two years as a um, registrar and then one year as a senior registrar and then a job came up. I, I think they were so interested in me that I almost thought that if you read the job description, it's all, they were talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, somebody with an interest in um, split liver transplant, somebody who can do pediatrics and it's, it's hard to find somebody like that unless you worked in that job and um, so I got the job um, and then things changed and I, I got my you know, permanent residency and citizenship and so um, uh, going into liver and liver transplant was in the plan? It, just happened. it was in the plan until I went to King's okay. um, and again I think uh, the opportunity I mean you might today to get into transplant training may be very difficult around the world the best of the hospitals are not easy to get but those days, I mean, I, I got the job only because there wasn't any local candidate wanting the, wanting the job. Um, it was a difficult specialty. Um, people, those days, we had to um, go on donor runs throughout the country. There was no regionalization. I think the first day I went to the King Jobs, I had to fly to Doncaster for a retrieval. Um, you're working day and night, you come back and implanting. We were only two registrars. Uh, the first year I went, uh, I think we did about 175 transplants with two registrars and two consultants and you're there all the time. Probably the reason Nobody wants to do a job like that. And also the, the local people probably at that time felt that um, there was no career progression for them. There were not many jobs. So not many people did liver as a, as a specialty in those days. So King's was a pioneering transplant? Yes, yes, yeah. I know Cambridge. Um, yeah, King's uh, was um, started as a King, King's College Cambridge program with right. Professor Roy Khan in Cambridge right. and Casey Tan in King's. Um, and then King's became independent. Roger Williams um, took it um, as an independent unit. And um, um, I, I mean, it, when I went there, it was early. I mean, everything about transplantation was pioneering, really. Right. To successfully do a transplant itself, I'm talking about. Um, so were there a transplant happening in Europe at the time? Or Yes, uh, many countries didn't. Uh, Italians didn't do transplants then. Uh, Greeks didn't do transplants then. Um, Israel didn't do transplants. There were, there were many countries which didn't do. They all came to Kings actually. And none in Asia at that time? None in Asia at that time. Okay. Not even Korea. Okay. 1991 was when I went into Kings. Okay. Now it's what? 30, 32 years. 32 years now. Um, so then it's uh, in three, four years really and Europeans started doing splits. The new innovative techniques came and Nigel and I used to travel to Brussels and 
uh, there was a professor there, Professor Ott, who was very close to us. He was a very pioneering pediatric transplant surgeon. And Casey Tan himself was a pediatric surgeon. Ni Nigel took an interest in it, and I took an interest in it. And I think we, the two of us, was a good partnership. And um, we were very involved in all the innovations, actually, including living donor. In fact, the first living donor we did, people would be surprised to know, was 1994. So that's almost 30 years ago that we started the pediatric living donor program in Kings. Um, and, and I mean, there was no need to do um, uh, living donor in, in uh, England. Otherwise, um, it, it would have picked up in a big way there as well. Um, so I think probably Kings helped because they had a strong hepatology and a strong intensive care and all round support. So it helped you grow. Absolutely. I think we had some of the best people there. Um, in terms of hepatology, it was Roger Williams. In terms of intensive care, it was um, Jules Venden and team, and John O'Grady in hepatology. Uh, on pediatrics, we had um, a very famous professor of pediatric hepatology, Alex Mowat, and then Georgina, and then Anil Dawan. Um, and on surgical side, it was me and Nigel, and then Paolo came in. We lost Paolo, as you know, recently. It's very sad. Um, so we, we really had um, some of the best people around, and we were, we were all similar age group, and we got on really well, actually. Um, and that's probably... So it's, really it's pioneering it's days, and you were there right at the beginning. Yes, yes. So, um, you think that shaped your career as a I, Yeah, probably. I mean, some people say you keep on pushing and pushing, and, you know, why do you need to even at this age do and learn new things and i feel that's been my life in transplantation you know all the time pushing looking for new things to do increasing the number i mean we reached 250 transplants a year in kings very quickly and stayed there for many years so looking back at your early career and maybe your career at kings uh, is there a role model mentor or someone who inspired you I've had a few role models in, in general surgery, actually, when I was doing general surgery. Um, probably nobody knows the name, like there was a guy called John Duthie, who was a general surgeon. I think I really admire him. Um, he was an extremely good surgeon who never got angry. Whatever he did, he never got angry. And also, when I went to Wirral, I was in Liverpool region, I had a very good consultant who was really fond of me. Um, and in transplantation, we were more or less like colleagues, Nigel and I, really. We were growing together. So other than Starzil and Roy Khan, probably there were nobody else. Yeah, I mean, at that time, I mean, I have met Starzil um, while I was in King's. I stayed there for two weeks. And uh, in fact, uh, Professor Roy Khan uh, and I do quite a bit of, in, initially we did some research together in the animal work and he helped us. He came and saw us. Okay. Uh, when we were doing some pig work on gene therapy, um, Roy Khan used to come and see. So, um, but I've never seen both of them operate actually. Um, so I don't know how they were as uh, surgeons, uh, but they were very pioneering people in the field of transplantation or so liver the transplantation. Steps or the process of transplant is just something uh, that you picked up or. Yeah, most of the work has been something that um, we picked up ourselves okay. <clears throat> in terms of split. I, I, people will be surprised to hear that um, when I was appointed as a consultant, I had only done six transplants independently. Okay. Um, I had never done a resection, a liver resection independently. So, I mean, we had to do everything ourselves. I mean, auxiliaries and splits. Every, every technique was um, our own making. It's not that we went to Europe and we saw somebody do it. We had our own way of doing it. Um, so it was all innovations, actually. I mean, before we did the first living donor, we never went to Korea or Japan to see how they were doing co living donor. We did it ourselves. And we had excellent results. It's not that we were struggling. Hmm. So even now, a lot of students have this uh, inclination to want to go to the UK to train, uh, even though the difficulties that you mentioned are still there to some extent. I think they've streamlined to a large extent. The thing I think it improved a lot yeah. after the early days. So if you're an you Indian, to, 
advise the youngsters anything about going to UK now or you feel that we have enough training centers in India that they can get? No, I think uh, there is no need to go for training in transplantation outside, mm -hmm. particularly UK because I believe that UK transplant centers are not better than Indian transplant centers. I can say that publicly, uh, even now, I think okay. you have much better surgeons and much better technical people here and it's more relevant to train if you're going to come back and practice in India anyway. But I think it still helps to go abroad for a short period of time. I think I became confident after going to the UK. I, when I was here, I wasn't confident at all actually. Um, at least, see, when, when I went to Pittsburgh, that's another thing. I was working in King's at that time. And Pittsburgh was the mecca for transplantation. And I went to watch the P P Pittsburgh surgeons. And I felt that we were not inferior. I thought we were doing as good or even better work um, than the Pittsburgh surgeons. So it gives you confidence when you, when you go abroad. It, give, it gives you the ability to communicate better. And I think also, in terms of ethics, of work that you do, uh, being exposed to um, uh, European countries or um, United States, I think would be would be useful. Actually, I, I I do not think it's a waste of time going abroad, at least for a short period of time. Sure. And I think we're seeing more and more surgeons learn in India, stay in India, and do good in India. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can tell you the best surgeons I have with me sure. have never been abroad. Yeah. So, after a, say, 15, <coughs> 20-year career in Kings, uh, you came back to India. So, can you tell us the thoughts behind it? it just um, or yeah, I, I, th I think initially it was just for a short period of time. And um, you were coming to Hyderabad on and off? Yeah, I had a friend. Um, on a sabbatical. Yeah. Dr. Ravindranath was a close friend and he used to come to Kings visit us and wanted to set up a liver transplant program. I mean, in that way, I think he had a vision. He felt that transplantation is the way forward. And maybe around that time, I think Dr. Soin, Dr. Subhash Gupta started programs in Northern India. There was nothing in the South. So he asked me to come. And in fact, in the beginning, he said, why don't you come and do transplants um, in Hyderabad? And initially, he asked me to stay for three months. And I stayed for three months. I think I did three transplants and I was really frustrated. What's the point in wasting? I came and then I went back and then and then he said things were improving and sometimes he'd have a donor or something like that. I've even come once or twice like that. Okay. After they identify a donor, come and do transplant. Okay. Um, we had a good hepatologist there in um, Hyderabad, uh, Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor, who was capable of managing anything actually. Okay. So, um, so that's how it was for one or two years and then he said, if we have to improve, you have to be here for a year. Can you take a sabbatical and come? And uh, in fact, that year, I received my salary still from Kings and um, uh, Global just reimbursed my salary for that year. And, uh, and they agreed, really. Kings agreed. That's when I changed my mind. When I came here, I saw the, really the opportunity. I think in the first year, I did about 60 transplants um, that time when I was here. And then, in fact, I had to go back to Kings at the end of it because it was only for a one-year arrangement. And when I went back to King's, I didn't like UK anymore. Okay. I didn't like King's anymore. Okay. So after three months, I returned back to India, okay. and I'm here. Sure. So is it the freedom to do things, or the... Uh, <coughs> I think things deteriorated in, in the UK. Okay. Um, we were used to innovations. We did what we wanted, and... I think there were so many regulations if you wanted to. We, in, in the current climate, how things are now, we couldn't have done, if, if it was there 25 years ago, we couldn't have done what we did. There was a restriction on everything. You had to put everything through a committee. Uh, you have to submit the outcome. Maybe it's all for good, so mavericks won't do what they want to do. But, um, and living donor was the future. And I thought if we are going to do living donor, transplants, UK is not the place to be and um, I mean I, I, my children were born there, they were brought up there I, and I, when I decided to stay it was very upsetting for the kids actually. One was just in university, the other one was at school. Um, my wife who always wanted to come back to India 
by then had realized that our life was in the UK. She didn't want to come back to India. In the early days, she was pushing me to come back to India, but later on, she didn't want me to go. But I think it's, um, I don't know, it's um, like addictive, isn't it, the work? So I stayed and also I came back to a city where I was born, I was brought up, I was well recognized and um, anybody you saw like seemed to... Yeah, 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 it's home. Yeah. So I came back home and right. my mother lives with me and, right. you know, right. so that, that made up for everything actually that I lost. I so mean... Is it more that you wanted to improve the transplant program in India? build the ecosystem where people can learn? Yeah, I, I, I think there was a need for people in India. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I was driven by purely service or... I was more driven by the science and the, and the techniques and... Do you understand? There was some yeah. selfish motive in pushing boundaries, you know? That's, that's probably one of the things that, that drove me. Um, um, and, and obviously it helped a lot of people and there was a requirement for India and that's why the numbers built up because if there was if there was no requirement for India then there's no point being here because then you wouldn't have the number and you don't have the thrill of you know doing things that you wanted to do I think it's a combination really um, so as you, I mean working in India comes with own, its own challenges I'm sure you know that and probably overcome a lot of them so you find that what you expected and what you've done till now, you're happy with what? what, what I, I think I'm more than happy. Okay. I feel that I've done well. Um, I've done better than I did in the UK. Um, I don't think I was that prominent, even though people knew I was working in King's, I was Nigel's colleague. Um, I was always Nigel's colleague, <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. Um, Always a number two, wasn't I? So, um, I, I think I've done good work um, and I've continued to learn and improve, really. Um, and I, I feel fulfilled, actually. I'm not unhappy that I'm here. I mean, if I was unhappy, then I would have gone back to um, UK long ago. And um, I, I think I've done some good work. And many people also told me that if you went to India, um, academically, you'll be finished. I mean, they even quoted K.C. Tan and he was a consultant. I was professor of liver surgery at King's College Hospital, something that many people couldn't even dream of. And I leave, I think one of the professor of hematology called me and said, well, what are you trying to do? You'll be, you'll disappear. But <laughs> that's not been the case. Uh, we published a lot. We, I think... Yeah, I published more in India than I w when I was in the UK. Um, I mean, I have, what, over 600 publications and um, even book chapters like in Grey's Anatomy and Bailey and Love. All of that has come really uh, after coming to India. Um, so I, d I don't think academically I've done badly. Maybe in terms of basic science research, I've lagged behind a bit because setting up laboratories and funding for that in the private sector has all been very difficult. But we are, we are progressing in that, in that side as well, with basic science research as well. It just shows that we have the talent pool and we have the brains. Just Definitely. Some structure and some guidance. Yeah. Really. It's team building, right. really. If you have to be able to build a good team, a reliable team, yeah. uh, to be successful in India. Yeah. I think. Um, a lot of people have failed because they have not built good teams. Right. Mm. So I think, uh, looking at you, kind of close but not working with you, I think probably one of the greatest achievements is what, what you have left behind as a training institute. The number of people who come through your Come training, through, yeah. Mm. Maybe start their own centers. So that does give you a lot of satisfaction. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think there is, own, uh, there is a requirement, there is a requirement yeah. for that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we have not just trained um, Indians, we have trained people from abroad and, uh, you know, okay. many people have gone so out and started. Likely, like Asan, Indian centers will also be a hub for others to come in. I think so. I, I mean, we have had American trainees who spent uh, six months right. here. Right. You know, Europeans want to come. come from when you yeah. started your journey from China. Oh, absolutely. Um, about your move away from 
your previous hospital. This is like your own hospital. You have to be totally not. <laughs> it's not my hospital. But, uh, I don't want it, people to think does this it is. Give you um, more freedom yes, I, I, I think one of the reasons um, I wanted this was um, everybody says our oh, private is, private sector is very expensive, and um, I have the 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 worst situation to deal with is when patients try and bring whatever money you say 24 lakhs 25 lakhs and they sell things and come for a transplant and something goes wrong and they're stuck in ICU for a month they don't have money to pay we have to support them so that sort of support and and the financial independence to do things I wanted and I think that is very much fulfilled here I mean I can if a young child comes with hepatoblastoma they don't have money Anywhere from in India, I would, I would operate on the child. We don't say no. I mean, we are in Tamil Nadu, as you know, it's a hugely advantageous position compared to any other state where the state is funding transplantation. But even in other things, uh, cancers, there are many opportunities, opportunities to help people without charging for them. I write off huge amount um, every month, really. Um, so that independence. And the other thing is, really professional development. One example I want to give is um, the robot. Okay. If I was in a corporate hospital, I would have to charge two lakhs extra for the robot, but we have not charged extra. Um, we actually offer the robotic donor hepatectomy for garment scheme patients. You don't get paid extra. Um, whoever deserves it, I mean if somebody can afford it, we could charge them. But if they can't afford it, but they still deserve it. For example, a 22-year-old girl, unmarried, wanting to donate for the father. I mean, I would never do an open now. Uh, we have now done close to 100 um, donor hepatectomies. Uh, in fact, we are trying to do a recipient today. So, since you brought up robotic, do you see a future I mean, for the young surgeons out there? I, I do that. I believe that. Uh, see. Donor and maybe even recipient is the future. Um, I don't know about uh, the application in the recipient um, and how necessary it's going to be. I, I, th I think, see, when you take the donor, I mean, I, I was never a minimally invasive surgeon. I mean, in the early days when um, laparoscopy was introduced, they were doing cholecystectomy for three hours. And I've helped uh, my consultants struggle through cholecystectomy for, you know, for three hours, four hours, uh, that's all. And then I moved into liver, so I was never exposed to minimally invasive surgery. Um, but I've always had this um, uh, feeling that um, I, I'm lacking something, not being able to do minimally invasive. I've always encouraged my, um, my people, the, the surgeons who work with me, to develop, you know, laparoscopic hepatectomy, but even though they can do wedge excisions and some left lateral segmentectomy laparoscopically, it never took off in like it is in a in like some some surgeons who can do, and I always felt deficient actually about that. And then we purchased this robot just before um, um, the XI system, just before uh, the pandemic, and I had quite a bit of time during the pandemic, so I I decided I need to learn this if this is to progress. So I spent a lot of time during the pandemic um, on the console training and training. And then when I really started to do, first we started with left lateral segment. The first 25 cases we did were left lateral segments actually. And within the six or seven cases, I was able to do it at exactly the same time as open surgery. And now I feel with, with the robot, I think, it's even better than open surgery. And even in terms of safety, I have no worries about the um, robot, actually. So I don't know. I, I mean, if you ask me, I would preferentially do robot if cost is not the issue. Yeah, I think the robot has to come down like laparoscopes and be available in mm -hmm. smaller centers for it to become useful. I can, I'll tell you today, I think in 10 years' time, you couldn't do... Um, donor surgery without having robot um, and also I think any surgery for that matter it's not just even general surgery um, wherever it's possible to do simple laparoscopic in because of the cost people could still do laparoscopic surgery 
Uh, but once um, uh, laparoscopic surgery becomes complicated, robotic is much, much safer. Um, so there is no point trying to do very difficult liver surgery laparoscopically. It's so much easier if you switch to the robot. Yeah. I mean, uh, as you know, robotic heart surgery is also picking up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you said, it may be the future. So for a young surgeon, should he aspire to be a robot-based surgeon? In Minimally invasive is here to stay. I think I, I think the young surgeons will pick it up better than the older surgeons. Yeah, I think <laughs> the older surgeons are going to be phased you out. Pick up when you're yeah, older, yeah, I, you know, I think it yeah. must be when you're younger, yeah. because I've not been exposed to it that I didn't learn. Yeah. But once I took that fear away and, and said that I'm going to learn it, I was able to learn very quickly. Okay. I mean, even at this age, it was an exciting time for me um, to learn something new. And, and also, I mean, there are sometimes there are surgeons who learn new things and they do it and they, when you watch them, they're not doing it so well, even though there are many surgeons like that who may not necessarily do surgery well, but they continue to do. I don't feel that way with me. I think I, I do it well and I've been able to learn to do it well. Um. So, if you go back to the ILTS, this is your president here. Yeah. So, have you thought about what you want to do for the ILTS from uh, both in terms of your own personal uh, roles and as an international society and also as an Indian group, how can we link up to the ILTS? Yeah, I think ILTS is uh, changed. It's definitely changing and I think it's become truly international. If you look at all the committees and uh, the SIGs, the special many interest groups. The societies of other specialties are still very much Western focused. Yes, but yeah. I, I think ILTS is, is, is uh, truly international. It is changing. I mean, I am an example right. um, for ILTS to show that it's become truly international. Uh, what There are still people who feel that um, uh, it's not easily accessible, um, and particularly from the East. And I mean, um, the representation from Korea and Japan are not so much in ILTS, like Iran, okay. you know, even though they do large numbers, they are not fully represented. Okay. Uh, I feel that they'll be able to communicate with me better than they have done before, you know. Um, and, and I think, I mean, it, it, I'm an ILTS president, I can't say that we'll work with India. I mean, working with India is part of it. But my presidency, I've decided that I'll travel a lot for this year with um, local um, international societies, local societies in each country, um, and get them engaged in various um, aspects of ILTS. That's, that'll be my work. And part of that is going to be working with um, the LTSI as well. Okay. You will know that in January, I brought the consensus meeting yeah. to Chennai. And the consensus meeting subject matter is going to be on living donor liver transplantation. It's going to be on small fossa syndrome and uh, you know um, and portal flow modulation. That's a consensus meeting, and uh, that's an ILTS meeting along with the LTSI. And I'm getting the ILDLT, the the living donor study group as well, international living donor study group involved. So we'll have a lot of people. Um, so that'll be good. And I hope I'm hoping that in in two years' time, we'll be able to bring the main ILTS meeting to India. We are working on that as well. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a great opportunity for Indian transplant doctors to interact internationally and have more exposure. Absolutely. I think. So are you the first Asian president? Or there, have been uh, there has been presidents from Hong Kong. Okay. But um, apart from that, um, no South Asian president, nothing. Actually, I'm a UK citizen. There's never been a UK president for ILTS. There's never been a president from Japan, Korea. Um, so I, I think it's a huge opportunity handed over to me. And right. um, these are the changes that kind of expose others. Yes. To ILTS yeah. And then aspiration changes. The youngsters mm. look up to you, follow you. Yeah. So I think it's great for us. Um, any message to the young doctors? How they should be, what they should have. Young doctors, I think um, life can be a struggle, but the future is bright. They've chosen the right field. It's an expanding field, 
and there is a potential for this to be tenfold of what it is currently. So nobody is going to go without work. So work hard, learn the best you can, and provide the best service for patients. So I want to finish off on a personal note. Okay. Uh, Work-life balance, how important do you think it is? Work-life balance, I've been very poor in that. Yeah, um, you think of you as a work Yeah, I know. I, I work until late, but um, um, I spend um, time exercising in the morning. I, okay. I, I've always done that. I come to work late, only after 10.30. But with the robotic um, introduction, even that's gone, because then I have to come early in the morning as well. I finish around 9.30, 10 o'clock. I hope uh, things will change. It's a struggle with the family, if I agree. Yeah, but um, it's, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I'm not stressed out doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I guess when you're enjoying it, it's hard work. It yeah, is. yeah. Mm -hmm. But as you know, in India, there is a, the, the work-life balance concept doesn't exist compared to other countries. So we work on Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah, uh, full time. I mean, many times on Sundays too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so do you... I mean, to make up for the lack of time in your working days, do you have a period of time that you take off to do other things, like a couple of weeks a year? You know, I used to travel a lot to the UK before. Every month I used to go back to the UK okay. for a week and spend time, but okay. that's not stopped now, okay. actually. Um, but I, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy what I do. I mean, I but listen to music. Burnout is becoming a big issue in India. Yeah, I think it depends on individuals. Yeah. Individuals, you know. I, so I have a message is enjoy what you do. And then yeah, if you enjoy what you do, it's fine. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you briefly mentioned about hobbies and passion. So, what interests you? Uh, I listen to music a lot. I mean, there's a lot of time while operating. Right. I mean, I the, uh, that's why I said the Kalakshetra exposure has given me an interest in um, uh, Carnatic music. We listen to that a lot. Okay. And I'm a... Um, Great fan of Tamil language. Okay. To an extent, you could call me a uh, fanatic. Yeah, I memorize things. Uh, maybe to um, to delay me becoming demented. Maybe you know. So I memorize a lot of uh, poetry and um, I've been giving talks as well. I mean, now, for I think. People who don't know, Kambaramayanam is a Tamil literature, and it's a very hard uh, to grasp what is written. And uh, Mohammed Leila can understand it and just speak for one hour. <laughs> Come on. So I think sometime you should do it for the LTSI. Yeah, I'll do that. I think i done it in English as well. And right. uh, I think this year in the Kamban Karagam, which is uh, where all these specialists come together, they asked me to give a talk. Right. Uh, I believe they are giving me an award as well. So okay. that's sure. that'll be nice. Sure. So I think uh, it's been a fascinating insight to your mind and how you, you are, what you are. Uh, thank you so much for Thank you, thank you, Murugan. Yeah. All the best for whatever you nice do. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, LTSI.